Thank you. Thank you so much. I wanted to start today with a question, uh, which is, you know, something that I think about all the time since I've made my whole career around food and nutrition. Um, what is the purpose of food? So, so, something you guys can think about and have your own answers. For me, my answer is to nourish humanity so that we can produce fruits and enjoy them. And that second part is going to be important to what I'm going to talk about with you guys today. Um, so we're going to be talking a lot today about not just what we should eat. This is, you know, you guys are a really intelligent crowd, and there are so many things out there offer, offering prescriptions for what exactly we should eat and what exactly we should not eat. And that's not so much my philosophy, because I think in humanity we have this kind of intuition on what's actually good for us. I mean, if we really think about it, we, we pretty much know. Um, but what we need to do is really think about uh, just what we should eat and what we should not eat, but here's the big question I want to talk about today. What do I want to feel like in my life? So over the last 15 years, I've had the real privilege to talk with lots of kids, adults, parents, families, communities. I've coached them. I've helped them with recipes um, and hopefully inspired them a little bit to kind of change their lifestyle around food and the way they think about food. And a lot of times people are coming to me saying, you know, what should I eat? Show me what I should eat. Come into my pantry. Dig around. Tell me what to get rid of. And we can do all of that. That's great. That's a really good place to start. It's kind of like cleansing when you like just need to start over and start fresh. Um, but the constant question that I ask them to ask themselves and what I'm asking you to ask today is, what do I want to feel like in my life? And if I felt great, if I felt amazing every single day, what would I do with that? What would I do with that energy? And that is the guiding principle about what we want to eat. Um, as I begin to talk today about my eat cake and vegetables um, philosophy or waffles or pizza or whatever your cake is, whatever that extra thing is, that you sometimes think, oh, I'm not, I'm not supposed to eat that, I'm not allowed to eat that. Scratch that. You're allowed to eat what you love. You're allowed to enjoy your life. That's the great gift that we've been given. But um, I want you to think about, you know, not just about um, the things you can and can't eat. We're going to be talking a lot about fruits today. Um, I'm a big fan of fruit, but not just because it's good for you, because it's, it is really life's reward. It's sort of nature or creator, if you believe in that. The reward for us, you know, there's all these things we have to do in life, all this hard work and toil, and then the rewards are this beautiful sky and these awesome mountains and these delicious, juicy peaches and incredible fruits. So I'm, when we talk today about um, this kind of philosophy, I'm going to be using the the analogy of fruits a lot to talk about the fact that fruits are our rewards in life, the things that we want more of, the things we want to feel, the things we want to experience, the things we want to do and see and achieve in our lives. Um, so cake is a really easy uh, fruit, a really easy reward. So, you know, fruits, fruits are really rewards. And cake is a really easy reward for us to think about because, you know, if you're a parent, you're really familiar with this philosophy. Eat your vegetables, you can have a piece of cake. Like, we've all done that negotiation, or we've done it with our parents, or we've done it with our kids, or we've done it with ourselves. Um, and it's a, it's a really, like, put this in, you get this out kind of philosophy. But I want you to think about cake as something much, much bigger. Uh, it's everything you want in life. And vegetables, for the purposes of our talk today, are everything that nourishes us. All the habits, all the foods, all the people, all the environments that really nourish us in our lives. Um, because I want, when we're talking about fruits, I want you to be thinking about not just what can I do, what, you know, what do I want to feel like in my life, what do I want to achieve in my life, but how do I feel when I'm doing it? So here's an example. Um, I want you to be able to say not just, last year I got to go to Paris, but last year I got to go to Paris and I rode my bike down the Champs-Élysées and I climbed to the very top of the Eiffel Tower and I ate the most amazing cheese and I felt great the whole time. So that is the purpose of this kind of questioning what we should eat, not just so we can be thin or we can do better yoga or, you know, we can live to be 120, which everyone seems to want to think we can do these days. Um, so I want you to stop for a minute and think about what is that cake for you? What's your fruit? What do you want to achieve? What do you want to feel? So we're going to take a couple of minutes. Just think about that. I didn't, you didn't know I was going to make you work your brains this morning at 10 o'clock. Hopefully you've all had breakfast because I find that really helps me to think better. Um, so a lot has been published over the last decade 
about what we should actually eat. Um, we know things, we know tangible things. Like for example, we know that there's a mind-body connection that science is finally starting to realize and starting to acknowledge. We know that things like tryptophan, which you'll find in turkey or chocolate, can release serotonin in your brain, the natural antidepressant. We know that lack of sleep can cause us to overeat or um, that lack of sleep can sometimes cause us to, it can override our hunger. Um, we know that, you know, the, the um, that emotions can override our hunger and cause us to either not eat or overeat. We know that anthocyanins that are found in um, blueberries, what make the blueberry blue, might make our minds sharper. And we know that the red lycopene that's in tomatoes and watermelon um, can actually help prevent against cancers. So there's all these great facts that we know. Um, but we, we really want to take, you know, and one of the things that, that I think is very new that people used to not talk about a lot throughout all the, the decades when you would see these Time magazine covers, I don't know if anyone saw the recent one about now that we can eat butter again, um, which I've thankfully been doing for the last 30 some years. Um, we're, for, we're a butter family and you can probably tell, but anyway, um, you know, these, these dogmatic things that everyone wants to be able to say and hold on to. Like, oh, no more cholesterol, don't eat eggs anymore. And they put it on the cover of Time Magazine and they publish all these studies. And there are, there are scientific facts, yes. You can find, you can conclude just about anything. And in fact, when I studied integrative nutrition, um, we actually went through every possible diet and learned every single, you know, at the time, this was about eight years ago, now there's new ones. But, you know, we studied Atkins and we studied vegan and we studied vegetarian. And throughout the course of this training, I tried on a lot of these diets for myself to see what they would feel like in my skin. Um, and after you would hear these amazing, fantastic speakers that would talk about being vegan, you would be like, absolutely, I must be vegan. You know, because they were, there, there are facts. There's facts to support anything. And there's facts to support that you should eat meat and how wonderful it is. And there's facts around everything. But the thing is, there's no magic formula. We're all so individual. And if we're looking for the magic formula and the magic bullet and the magic thing, we're going to come up short. You know, these days, it's kale. In the 1970s, it was broccoli. But no amount of kale can save humanity. That's not the point, you know? So, um, you know, we're in a really exciting time and obviously all of you here are already kind of probably deeply entrenched in that. We're in a time when science has realized, um, and even the, the most staunchly um, strict scientific um, doctors and physicians and, and researchers have acknowledged, yes, there's a mind-body connection. It's also woven in with the way we sleep and our stress levels and how happy we are and our relationships, you know. And of course, if you, if you study those seven countries that, you know, where people, they have the most octogenarians or centenarians and things like that. And, and they have all these things in common. You know, they eat fish and they do physical labor in order to get their water or their food. So they're doing functional exercise. They have great relationships with their family. They have a spiritual life. They believe in something. There's all these common things. And food is one of them, but it's very deeply interwoven. And just like it's deeply interwoven in how it performs in our life, how food makes us perform in life, the way our food grows is deeply interwoven. I read a great book last year called Pharmacology, and um, I'll show you the slide at the end with the, the cover so you can remember it, because it's just such a fantastic eye-opening look um, from a, a fantastic doctor in San Francisco. And she had seen all these really young, healthy women just keep coming in with chronic problems. And how can a 20-something-year-old woman, you know, just who looks physically healthy, just have all these same problems all over again? And she actually traveled back to farms and found the relationship between the microbes that are in the soil of where your food grows and how that relates to the microbes that are in your tummy and the you know, things that we, we all know about now, probiotics and your gut health and all of these things we talk about. So there's no lack of evidence that we're deeply interwoven with our entire environment and our entire community and what we eat is not just what, what we choose to eat, but where it grew and how it grew and who you bought it from and how they care about the earth. And all of these things are so deeply intertwined. So that's, that's a really exciting thing. Um, and... I want to, um, so as we, as we talk about all of these things, we'll talk a little bit more later about like what to eat and things like that. But what I really want to do is take a big step back today. That was a long intro. I'm still in the intro. Am I okay? Um, and what I really want to do is take a big step back and talk about your personal relationship with food. Because food can be such a nourishing for force in your life. 
Um, but the answer isn't, like we said, in one miracle food. So just a little anecdote. Picture you're in a suburban neighborhood in northern Illinois, a uh, little house on the corner, nothing special, just very happy little home, and a fence, and a little girl about six years old peering over the fence. And what is she looking at? The neighbor's plum tree. And this is me. And these are the cool neighbors, the wealthies. They've got older, big kids. They've got an RV and a pool and all these crazy things like my parents would never, ever do. Um, they're kind of like borderline hippie. This is the 70s, you know. But, you know, my sisters, and they, they all want to go and play in the pool, and they want to go sit and look at the, like, the biggest TV at the time we've ever seen, which is slightly bigger than that <laughs> computer. Um, they think, you know, like, those are the coolest things about the wealthy's house. I think the coolest thing about the wealthy's house is they have two plum trees. And once in a while when we get invited for a swim date, I get to pick the plums. And for me, that was just the most magical experience, to take a piece of fruit off of a tree and eat it like within seconds of its life force pumping through it. Of course, I didn't at the time think about life force, but I just thought, holy cow, like I was always a big eater, never had trouble getting me to eat. And to go outside your back door and just get fruits and vegetables whenever you wanted, I mean, especially fruits, that just, that just blew my mind. Um, I'm from, I hail from two farming families, one in, Illinois, uh, one in Iowa and one in Missouri. Uh, but by the time I came along, my parents had wised up and moved on to other careers and moved our family to suburbia and like, many, many farming family stories go, they recognized that they could buy fruits and vegetables and other foods in the supermarket and do absolutely no work to get it, you know? And, and they didn't have to cultivate it and wash it and, you know, wring the chicken's neck and pluck the feathers. I mean, they did all those things growing up. Of course, my dad always says now to, to live as richly as he lived as a farm boy with nothing, you'd have to be a millionaire. But, um, you know, they had all these great things, but they said, oh, this is great. We're going to raise our four kids in suburbia, and we're going to um, go to the supermarket and buy all these great, you know, cereals that have all these awesome vitamins in them and all these great things I was lucky to get to eat as a kid. Um, but so I said to them, oh, wouldn't it be so cool if we could plant fruit trees? And uh, they said, no, we have a nice manicured lawn where we like to play catch and football and all that stuff. Um, and so I did what most kids did, and I did it anyway. Every single piece of fruit I ate for four summers running, I planted. I planted peaches, I planted watermelons, I planted plums, and nothing ever grew. It was the first heartbreak of my life. Um, but the thing is about seeds is that every time you make an intention in your life, every time you say, I want to do something that's good for me or for my family or my community, every time you say, I want to do something that's nourishing, I want to cultivate something, I want to create something, I want to grow something, it grows. And now, in my own backyard in upstate New York, I have seven fruit trees. Now, those didn't literally, obviously, come from the seeds that I planted when I was six and seven and eight years old. Um, but for me, they did. That, that was a seed that I planted in my life that I wanted. And I really believe that if you have something pure and passionate and, and whole in your life that you love and that you want to achieve, if you plant a seed for it now or later, it will grow. So I want you to think about what are the seeds from your life that have already been planted, or if there's nothing that kind of gets your mind going around that, what is one seed you're going to plant this summer, in this summer season, to cultivate a new frame of life around food in your life? For you, for, you, for your family, for your community, maybe it's a community garden at your kid's school, maybe it's a planting a windowsill garden in your apartment in New York City. I want you to just think about for one second and make a little intention right now. So, everybody have something? Raise your hand if you need more time. Uh, we don't, we, I only have 20 minutes. I'm on the clock, so I can't really let you guys ruminate on that too long. Um, so, you know, before, before something grows fruits and produces fruits, it puts down roots, right? Um, and sometimes, before you even see the fruits at all, there's a deep root system going. And the root system, in some cases, like in the case of a radish, this is, these are just pictures that I like and that I took. So they don't all mean something, you don't have to study them. Um, but in the case of a radish or a potato or a carrot, the root system is actually the storehouse. That is actually the food. And that storehouse is something that the plant draws upon over and over again until you, until you, um, until you, 
harvest the fruit or the vegetable. Now, we all have roots. We all have roots. And of course, you know, if we are um, good yogis, we all know the practice of standing and letting your feet root into the ground and your arms reach up to the sky and all those great analogies about being trees. So imagine that we're all trees and we're deeply rooted and our, our branches are reaching up and our goal is to blossom and our goal is to produce fruit all over our branches. So I want you to think about the roots in your life. Now, the thing that's interesting about roots versus weeds, when, whenever you have growth, there are weeds, right? There are weeds, they start to come up. And, and weeds and, and even like branches that aren't healthy can later be pruned, that's easy. But the roots, that's the really important part because once you have a mature plant, if it's a radish, you know, if you have a radish, if you planted it, you don't really replant it later, it just doesn't really work. Or a mature tree, there's a reason we don't move mature trees once they're already you know, ripe and, and producing fruit and, and really mature because the root systems get really huge. And that's the part that is really, really important. And I think we all have positive root systems. For me, my root system is a family who ate around the table and who said our prayers before dinner and we had a very spiritual household. Um, we had a lot of homemade foods, lots of homemade baked goods, and the occasional um, strawberry Pop-Tart, of course, because you wouldn't be a, a healthy 70s kid if you didn't have a Pop-Tart now and then. Um, but we all have roots, and some are positive of them, some are negative. They're not all good. But I want us to really focus on the positive roots. We all have them. Maybe your mom baked bread, you know, maybe you planted a garden with your grandmother. Maybe there's things you haven't just thought about in so long, but that's there. It's in you. And that's what we're going to draw upon over and over again in our lives. Um, and then, of course, there is growth. And growth is exciting. Growth is when everything just starts to shoot up. And, you know, there's weeds. And a good gardener, they know that you're supposed to pull the weeds, and that's going to make everything much easier later. But it's exciting, and everything's growing, and the weeds, you know, the weeds are fine. We all know what the weeds are in this scenario, right? The weeds are junk food and staying up too late, and staying up too late makes us sometimes overeat or make bad choices. Maybe the weeds are um, people or environments that don't support your healthy life, lifestyle or your healthy choices. Um, and it's, you know, you could pull those weeds. That'd be great. Um, but it's just, this is the good part. You're growing and you're thriving and this part you don't need my help with. Um, and, you know, we're all, I think, here because we're in that growing phase in our lives, which is really exciting. Uh, but I want to talk about something that's very real in our lives and also in, in the lives of, of your life as a tree, let's say, um, which is the dormant season. Um, and I just actually came out of a really intense, probably the most intense dormant season of my life. I had written a cookbook, um, my second cookbook. I'd been out there and promoted it. I was a year into a new job. My daughter, who was, you know, a sweet little baby and would do everything I wanted, turned three. Um, a lot of things were happening, and then we had this, or most of you from the Northeast, this brutal winter. So it started out great, snowshoeing, you know, I was baking, I was eating all the great foods that are in season that I knew I should be eating, and kale and turnips and making all these great stews and soups and having a big time, lighting fires, you know, everything was great. But then the snow just kept coming. And I just had to keep going to work every day and things were just like, what is going on? Um, and this was a really tough dormant season for me. And, you know, I think it's important to acknowledge that we have them for many reasons. One, because we're always going to have them. Have you ever seen a tree that blossoms and fruits the entire year? I never have. And if you find it, I want to know where you got it. Um, but we're like that. We need that time. This is our healing time. And for me, this was a time when I actually, for the first, you know, of course, I've lived in a um, four-season climate for many, many years. But for whatever reason, this, this season out of the garden was really hard for me. There was nothing to plant. You know, my garden was packed under snow, and I thought I would never see the end of it. Um, so I really turned inward, and I, was, I, I, I figured out that no am amount of fresh, squeezed, cold-pressed kale juice was going to heal me 100%. Um, you know, and I was, I was making some bad choices, and I was just eating tons of bread and butter and all the good things that, you know, but I just wasn't feeling great, and I knew I was in a funk, and I had to do something about it. Um, so in this case, it wasn't, it wasn't just food, you know, and I turned inward, and I really started cultivating my sort of spiritual garden and really turning to prayer and meditation and reading some really interesting books about, um, you know, everything in, in your life from food to the Thrive. I don't know if anyone's read that great book, Thrive. Um, there's just so many things out there right now that you can 
that kind of integrate. And, and little by little, I started getting back to where I was. And, and you know, during this time, even my favorite healthy foods didn't taste good to me. Um, and really nothing was tasting great. But I think that that's just an example of how interwoven our lives are with our emotions. Um, so, you know, the dormant season is real, and I think we need to acknowledge it, but also embrace it. Because sometimes out of that rest period, out of that time when we are forced to go in and say, what do I need to change here? What's different? Um, comes great, great creativity and great, great health. And for me, this has been one of the most in incredibly creative springs of my life. Um, I'm writing more than I ever have. I'm shooting better photos than I ever have. You know, I'm cooking more exciting food. I'm really cultivating my relationships with my community in a way that I've never done in the last few years. Um, so things, things can really improve um, when we take that dormant se season and really examine it and say, what can we do with it? Um, and so now I want to talk about, you know, again, we're now in, we're in spring, we're growing, it's growth, 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 everything's exciting and wonderful. Um, but this is, the, this is the other really hard part, and then we're going to get past the hard part into the good part, um, which is pruning. If you've ever planted a fruit tree, and the first time I saw a pruning diagram, I nearly wept. I was like, what in the world? You want me to cut back 30% of my, do you know how much that fruit tree costs? You want me to cut, cut back 30% of that peach tree? You know how long I waited to see anything on that tree? Um, but nearly every year, that's what you have to do. You have to prune back the branches that are crossing each other and getting in each other's way. Anything that um, is too tight, that it doesn't let the air circulate around it. So that's how fungus has happened when, you know, peach or, or raspberry bushes are too tight and there's too much water and they can't, they can't air out. That's why you have to tie up, you know, your tomatoes and things like that. Um, and pruning is, is really kind of a hard thing to do because it's very intentional. You have to take these clippers and you have to do it. Um, and you have to decide, you have to make a decision. Is this branch going to go or is this branch going to go? And all you're doing is you're, you're filtering in all this knowledge that you have in your life. And, and you know, you can read every gardening book or every uh, self-help book if you want to make the, the personal analogy. But you still have to filter it through your personal sense of, of understanding and knowledge about what's the best thing to do in this situation. Cut, cut that branch or that branch. So we all have pruning to do, and I think that that's not something... Um, easy, but it's something that we must do. And I'm, you know, I'm still in the midst of a, a pruning situation in my own life where, like, I know there's some branches that need to go. And here's the tricky thing. A lot of them actually look healthy. It's not just the dead ones you need to get rid of. There are things that look healthy, but maybe they, like in the case of a rose, they have five leaves, and when they start getting to the point where there's three leaves, you need to get let, let go of those, or you're not going to get more roses. Or in the case of a fruit tree, anything that has good, healthy growth but doesn't have any buds is never going to produce fruit, no matter how healthy your soil is, no matter how much light and water you give it, it's never going to produce fruit, so those have to go. Um, and where I think this is important is for us as a, as a bigger culture. What's really, really, where, where we're really in trouble right now is, is where we need to do some massive pruning as a culture and as a country. Um, we know that right now we're producing 10 billion animals a year just in this country alone to feed our meat, our meat addiction. Um, and I'm not a strict vegetarian. Uh, my husband is, but I still occasionally eat meat. But even Mark Bittman, who's a, you probably all know from the New York Times, he's not a strict vegetarian. He writes a lot of vegetarian stuff. He said in a recent TED Talk, we are, um, we're not eating meat out of any nutritional need. We're eating meat out of a, a, a sort of, um, we're eating meat to fuel a, like a sickness, really. We're, we're fueling a kind of odd malnutrition. It's not for nutrition that we eat it. We don't really need it. Um, and it's not to say you have to cut it out. It's just to think about, do we need it? How much, you know, we're eating two times as much protein in this country as we need. And even the first thing people ask if you go on a vegetarian and vegan diet, are you getting enough protein? There's an enormous amount of protein in plant foods. Beans and whole grains are loaded with protein. Even potato has a teeny bit of protein in it. And not, not to say that you should run out and eat a lot of potatoes. But um, so I think that there is so much, there's so much that we need to prune in our, in our, um, in our culture right now. There's, there's processed foods that claim to have so much health food properties in them. You know, there's just, there's boxes and boxes and boxes of things that like make you feel like you're going to live forever and you just want to grab that bar and go, go, go. But the thing is the go, go, go and that like, here we go is what can get us in trouble. And um, we really have to take the time to look at what those things are doing. And you guys are intelligent. And I'm asking you to be, um, to be the, make the decision for your own life. Don't let marketing or 
you know, whatever is telling you that's great. So in your own life and also in your communities, you know, it's really hard as a parent. It's really hard when you go to a birthday party to be the parent that's like, oh, bummer. We're having that today, you know? Um, but and you don't want to be that girl at the office or whatever that's always like a downer. It's not about that. It's about joy. It's about like all the amazing things and all the wonderful feelings you have when you eat right and when you don't take shortcuts because your body knows when you take shortcuts. So um, so I think, I think the pruning project that we have ahead of us as a nation is pretty huge. Um, you know, we know, we, we know the things we need to get rid of. We need to get rid of sugary beverages and, and um, coffee drinks, you know, like frappuccinos with like um, as much sugar as you're allowed to really have in four days. And there are even things that, that seem to be healthy, like yogurt, which a lot of yogurts, uh, yogurt obviously probiotics are wonderful, but a lot of yogurts actually have, if you don't read the label, some of them have as much sugar as a sugary cereal you would never, ever dream of eating. So we just have to be really aware of that. Um, so all this talking I'm doing, and I haven't even told you what you should eat, right? Um, I might need to consult my notes a little bit for this one, but there are so many things we do know. We do know that a plant diet promotes health. It's without a shadow of a doubt. With every single study that comes out, that really, that really come, rings true over and over again. Dr. Katz, who's the um, director of preventative medicine at Yale University, um, he's not necessarily a vegetarian proponent. Like, a lot of these guys are not. Um, they don't say, you know, they're, no one, they're not coming out and saying, you should only eat vegetables. But what they're saying is, you need to eat a heck of a lot more vegetables, guys. Um, we know that in this country, only 1.5% of Americans eat the amount of fruits and vegetables that are recommended to us. 1.5%. That is really, really, really sad. We can do better than that. Um, so we know that you know, there are so many things that we know and so many things, so many models have been set up for us. Um, and I think what we need to do is, is really be aware that there are so many agendas out there and if a study comes out and it tells you something, yes, there are probably facts behind it. But use your wisdom, use your more, you know, use your life wisdom, listen to your body. What is it telling you? How do these feel, foods feel in your body? There's a couple of... Um, resources that I really like. You'll notice the USDA food pyramid is not up here. Um, these are a couple of things that I really like. This is Dr. Wheel's anti-inflammatory um, pyramid, which I just like because it literally shows you what you should and shouldn't eat. They're not illustrations. It's actually things you want to eat. Um, and you'll see like all these great things, fruits and vegetables. There's just tons of them along the bottom. And there's grains. There's tons of whole grains. But there's even things that you enjoy, like white pasta, um, in, in small amounts. And there's, of course, who doesn't love avocado? And wonderful fish and mushrooms and, you know, eggs. And at the top, there's a little bit of chocolate, ginger, turmeric. There's so many exciting things. Um, one I'm particularly a fan of on the top left is just a food pyramid that we used to use at um, the integrative uh, the School of Integrative Nutrition where I studied, that where you talk about how spirituality and um, your physical activity and your career, which could be whether you actually work or not, just the things that you're putting your life towards, um, and your relationships, how integrated that is, and water even. Um, strangely, water's not on so many food pyramids, and that's our life force, you know, just running through us. Um, and then this is a little bit unfood related, but important, I think, uh, which, which is really the circle of life that this tool has been so helpful for me personally, and also for so many people that I've worked with. I've really seen them um, use this over and over to great result. And you see all these little pieces of your life, joy and spirituality and creativity and finance and career and education and health and home cooking and home environment, all these things. And what you do is you, you make this and you say, well, where am I feeling today? I'm with all you beautiful people and I'm going to do yoga tomorrow. And we're going to have a great meal tonight. Um, and creativity, I'm, I'm up here. I'm having a great time. Career is good. Everything's good. E, I could definitely stand to be exercising more. Um, you know, social life, haven't seen my best friends in a while. So what you do is that you do put your dots and then you draw around it. And what you end up with a lot of times is this weird amoeba. And it's okay if your circle is kind of small because you can always grow your circle, but you want to grow your circle evenly. Um, and home cooking, even though it's an equal piece of the pie with everything, in the terms of our talk today, home cooking is huge. It is really huge because what you make at home will always nourish you even more and it's probably always going to be healthier. Um, in terms of what we should eat, we definitely know that color translates to nutrients. We know we should be eating a very richly colorful diet. Um, we, we absolutely know that all of those colors 
are feeding our body with individual micronutrients that we need to thrive and that also fight disease. So these are all things that we know. And I want to read a, a quote from Dr. Katz that I think is really, really interesting. If you give me just a second. Um, he has probably published, you know, 45 major studies in the last decade that are, that are key studies in the world right now about nutrition. But what he said was this, um, a diet of minimally processed foods close to nature, predominantly plants, is decisively associated with health promotion and disease prevention and is consistent with seemingly distinct dietary approaches. So meaning all of those different things that have specific names, the South Beach diet, the Mediterranean diet, which by the way is consistently proven to be the diet that, we, that most of us should be on, which is tons of whole grains, fruits and vegetables, fish, olive oil, and other unsaturated fats, healthy fats. Um, he said, efforts to improve public health through diet are first all not for want of knowledge about optimal feeding of homo sapiens, but for distractions associated with exaggerated claims and failure to convert what we reliably know into what we routinely do. Knowledge in this case as, is not, as of yet, power. But I'm here to tell you that you have the power. You really do have the power. You have the power to make these decisions when you shop at the grocery store, when you feed your kids and other kids, when you, you know, cook for your friends and your colleagues, uh, and you really have the power to share this knowledge. Um, you also have the power to eat ice cream, so that's just why that's there. If you want to eat ice cream, you can have ice cream sometimes. And the thing is, when we cut out all of those other things we really don't need that, that aren't feeding our system, you can have ice cream from time to time, and it's okay. You can have cake. Um, so food, food is love, food is power, food is life. It is so interwoven with what we do. Um, and the other thing, the last thing I want to talk about is giving. When you have this knowledge, when you've learned all of these things that so many of you probably here have, you, pro you know, a lot of you probably shop organic or you grow something or maybe, you, maybe you've joined a CSA, uh, when, you're, when this knowledge and this life force of, of positivity is overflowing in you, I really want to encourage you to share it. Open up your home, open up your table, invite people in to see the way you eat. I have a friend who, when we were in college together, I didn't have the luxury of eating junk food, really, because I was kind of a chubby kid, so I had to really always be aware of what I was eating. And that turned out to be great, because I got to learn early on that what I eat really influences the way I feel. Um, but trust me, if you follow my Instagram, you know that I have plenty of treats. Um, but I have a friend who, who just, you know, had that luxury. She could just eat whatever. And, and more recently, in her 30s, um, has really... She got my book, and we started talking, and we started working together on, like, how to clean up her family, the way that her family eats. And she's, like, really serious about clean eating now. And it's so cool because she now started this cooking club in her neighborhood with just a bunch of other young ladies and moms and whatever, and all these other women. So, so you know, just this knowledge that she's gained, she's sharing with, like, nine other women who come into her house and see the way she feeds her kids and the energy they have and the focus she has and the things she's able to do with all this great energy she suddenly has because she's eating so well and she's making this a priority in her life. That's one way to share. Of course, you can share on you know, Instagram or you have a blog or you, know, you bring a really healthy treat to work or whatever, but I just want to encourage you to really share what you know, share that knowledge because that is really what makes um, the whole thing really work and the whole thing turn. So if you imagine we're those healthy yogi trees, right, with all of our blossoms, but if the tree next to us is really sick, that's going to affect us. So we cannot just worry about ourselves. We cannot just worry about our own families. It's very deeply interconnected with everyone around us. And by sharing and helping them to thrive and them to blossom and grow fruits, you're really helping the whole world around us. So I just want to encourage that. And I'm going to close just by saying uh, watermelon, my favorite food in the entire planet, is a good place to end. Who doesn't want a piece of watermelon today? Um, I just want to end by asking those same questions again. What is the purpose of food for you? For me, it's to nourish my life, my humanity, so that I can produce fruits and enjoy the fruits that I'm producing. So I want you to think again about that final question, which is, what do you want to do with your life? What do you want to feel like in your life? And if you felt amazing every day, what would you do with that energy? Let that be your guiding force. You don't need diet books. You don't need a million different formulas. There's no magic pill. You do have to do the hard work. Our body is a bank. If you withdraw, 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 you will come up with an empty bank account. It will keep score. 
you have to deposit. And some days a green juice is a deposit, and some days a piece of cake is a deposit. And you have to decide for yourself what's what. That's the hard part. There's no easy formula. But I know you can do it. And I think that you guys are all beautiful people, shining bright. I can't wait to see um, all of you out there doing your yoga. And I want to leave you with a couple of books that I found really inspiring and easy and fun and not, you know, super brainy and tough, hard reads. Um, these are all great. And these are great, too. These are mine. <laughs> um, so I'll be, I'll be around all day and um, looking forward to talking to you all. I will be, I'm going to go back to the other ones so you can see them as well, um, in case people wanted to write them down. I will be back there signing books, but most importantly, I just really want to meet you guys, hear your questions, which we're going to do now, um, and invite you guys to please come to the dinner if you're excited about eating as much as I am. Um, we have an amazing, amazing lineup. It's going to be a great meal, and the chef is, is pulling in some incredible local produce from all over, and beautiful bread. Some are gluten-free, some are... Um, some have weed in them, you know, there's just, there's just so much to offer, and um, I think the act of sitting down with people that you're growing with, as we're all doing here this weekend, is a really powerful thing, so um, go eat cake and vegetables, have a great, great weekend, and uh, thank you so much for coming.